Well, I started off smuggling on average, the biggest shipments would be about £10,000, which is about five metric tonnes. When I was arrested in 2006, the one single shipment they'd arrested us for had a shipment of £100 million. I changed my life in prison on the last sentence, and I made a conscious decision that I wasn't going to go down this road anymore. My choice, though, was to look at it and say, you know what, I can do more changing the system in a positive way than doing what I'm doing and destroying it. How much did the police confiscate off you? £1.3 million. <laughs> What's going on guys and welcome back to the Blue Tick Show. Opposite me today, I've got Andrew Pritchard. Some call him the king of some call him the king of raves, and others call him the joker. He's turned his life around and we finally got him on the show here today to tell his story. Welcome to the show. Hi, how you doing? I'm all good, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. Listen, you're, you've got more stories than probably all my guests put together. <laughs> so we want to hear them all. I want to hear why you're known as king of King of Raves, Joker, and I just want to know everything about you, pretty much. Okay. So, so without jumping into the nitty and gritty, yeah. let's hear about who you are, your upbringing, your family, because most people say it's their parents who turn them to turn them into who they are. Was that the case with you? Uh, no, far from it. Maybe it's the case now of the person I've become, uh, which has taken you know a number of years to become that person, but. Um, it certainly wasn't my parents who took me on a road, which yeah. uh, was a you know a, a definitely a road. But I would recommend anyone to go down, even though it has some incredibly exciting and uh, glamorous parts of it. But at the end of the day, as I always say to young people, it will end in death, destruction, and misery because there is only one you know way that can end up. But um, I'll take you through my life actually and sort of tell you how that started because people we are today are the fabric of our family and yeah, you know what's instilled in us usually. Um, so my background, um, I was born to Mavis Pritchard. Uh, she was one of the Windrush generation who came to England just after the Windrush arrived um, in 48, Windrush arrived, she was here in 51. My father, East End boy from out of Hackney, um, you know, working class, was a builder by trade. Uh, my mother and father, they met in about 54. My mother had uh, been in a previous relationship. Uh, that was an abusive relationship with her husband who came from Jamaica. They separated, my father met my mother. My dad was, uh, for an East End guy, it was very strange at that time because there was immigration, you know, the Wimrush yeah, yeah. immigration coming into London, which was obviously post-war and immigrants were treated terribly badly, you know, there's a lot of racism, stuff yeah. like that. My dad, he uh, made friends with a lot of the West Indian community, uh, so much so that one of his friends wanted to open a nightclub, which would have been the first kind of nightclub uh, in London for to play Caribbean music, which at the time was Minto, this was pre-Scar. And uh, my dad knew the difficulty she was gonna face, so he agreed to, you know, step up as like a director into the company so they could get a dance license, you know? Yeah. And it opened in Haringey, which is part of North London, small uh, venue uh, where they just play music and sell drinks illegally under the bar. And uh, was it rough back then, Hackney? No, well, Haringey, right, sorry? no, Hack Hackney. And you can understand this that the East End has always had this kind of cloud over it, you know, because a lot of you know people brought up there just as the Docklands is, you know, these were really working class places where people had it hard, you know, it wasn't a privileged place, it was somewhere you had to be strong to survive. Yeah, but the general ethic was very, very hard work, and that's why immigrants coming to this country tend to always be their first settlement port of call. If you look at the Jewish community which arrived in the East End, you know, um, you know, a, a post war, you then saw the, the you know, the following from that was the West Indian community coming here, then you had you know, people coming over, and Asian community arrived here, now you've got a strong Kurdish community moving into the East End, so yeah. it's where people come from and settle, but you've got to understand the vast majority are incredibly hard-working people and they want the best for their kids because they've come from a situation where they're very little or nothing, yeah. so they try the best for their children, you know, and they've suffered the hardships, so to speak. So, you know, pretty much so, it's rough and tumbles, yes, but if you go in at your way and you want to kind of find that life, it's very easy to find it because like everything, you know, where places, you know, aren't privileged, you know, there are lots of people who will take advantage and Definitely. try to make their own way in life. So yes and no, the answer to that question is, um, for my parents, hardworking people, incredibly hardworking people, 
um, had no reason to get involved in crime. And to be honest, I was quite a you know respectable child. Um, I was had to be because West Indian mother meant restricting discipline. You know, you couldn't talk to you know your parents or an adult full stop without referring to them as auntie or uncle. You know, you get slapped around the back of the ears yeah. if you even thought about talking to some an adult by their first name or you know behaving in a disrespectful manner. It was just things that were installed in you know in you as a kid, but. It also instilled a lot of stuff as well. We grew and we understood what the understanding of family was, which is really misconcepted now with a lot of young kids who are getting groomed into gangs. You know, they're given this belief of family. But back then, because we were in so few numbers, you know, when we went to... Because, you know, babysitters used to be babysitting your uncle had a house, you know. Yeah, yeah. They'd drop you off there for the day. So you met all your cousins and your family. And even kids who were dropped off of colour, who weren't your relatives, were still referred to as your cousins. So when you went to school, if there was a problem, you know, whoever it was, if you had colour, he was your cousin. Do you know what yeah, I mean? And yeah. we stuck together <coughs> because there was a few of us. Um, it's sad to see how it's divided now. It, it really upsets me. Now so everyone's against everyone. So important that why well, the work I do now, you know, is to try to change that narrative and let them see the hardships that the others went through. So yeah, parents were incredibly hard working. Um, I started off pretty decent kid. Where it all started to go wrong was my love for music. Um, I was, you know, I just had a natural gravitas to it. I don't know why. Maybe I inherited it. Perhaps I didn't. Perhaps I just fell to it for the area. Troublemaker at all in school. Not really, you know, Jack the Lad, obviously, yeah. at secondary school, had, you know, a group of friends. But never naughty, never getting in trouble, never... Not... Just funny, being not, a little shit. Not, yeah, basically, yeah, that's it. Going to all boys' school, Philip Magnus in, the, in, in, in King's Cross was like that. You know, um, you've had your friends, you messed around, you smoked cigarettes, you bumped yeah. off school occasionally. It started to go a little bit wayward towards the end of secondary school. I missed the last two years. Um, my parents tried to move me away from the area, which was a big mistake, because then I felt to myself, you know, I was away from my friends. Friends. So I tried to find a new, you know, something else to do, an identity, and moved further into the music, which was rooted sound systems, which was dominantly black Afro Caribbean culture. Um, we set up a sound system. I was my first march into entrepreneurship. Yeah. Put on events. How old so, was you at this point? Uh, 16, you know. Okay. So about this time, I was putting on parties. Illegal house raves, they were charging people admission, which of course was three pounds at the time, <laughs> selling, you know, beer and tenant super and brandy from. How much was a beer back then? But beer back then, I guess, was. So we used to sell a tenant for a pound, and we used to pay about 40 pence uh, a tin from the, from the, from the, you know, from the off, off license. license. And uh, so these were the kind of markups on profits that we got. Um, and obviously, there was this very limited bar selection because it was basically a shit, oh, excuse my language, a pass we'd go in there and basically it would be disused or, you know, being squatted in, we'd clean it up, yeah. uh, print flyers, and then put on the event. And it would be dominantly reggae music, and, you know, we'd kind of uh, gather a crowd, make a little bit of money. And uh, it was a funny journey because I was speaking to someone the other day about someone kind of um, sort of grew up with um, on the concentrated era we come from. It was really funny because a lot of people progressed to the music industry you know we had trevor nelson who's the yeah, radio yeah. one dj trevor lived on the opposite road to us and then oh, wow, there was nice. carla now who had shut up and dance but eventually shut up and dance they were part of the sound system and then there was a uh, kevin dj hype on drum bass djs and i was talking to kevin about this the other day and i remember it's like a story from once upon a time in america and uh going into the uh into the woodyard at night you know they stole a big bit of a chipboard it was about yeah. an eight before sheet you know and had to climb it over the top of the uh, yard and then walk it through the flats to get it home and obviously that was going to get sawn up the next day to make the first set of speaker boxes but if you'd been caught you know them times in like you know the very early 80s with a bloody well piece of chip ball through the morning they used to have these terrible police called the SPG who used to patrol the streets and their amusement basically was finding people of colour to drag off the street and beat the shit out of Seriously? literally three yeah they used to patrol the clubs there were popular clubs there like four aces cubies at the time phoebes you know and police would regularly you know patrol the street in their joint of amusement was basically to take off the street beat the shit out of you and you know toss you out the road somewhere and, you know, so when people talk about police brutality today, it's in retrospect absolutely nothing compared yeah. to what it was. And Stoke Newington Police Station was, was a notorious police station. Deaths in custody, you know, corruption. Serious, that bad? Oh, God, yeah, it was very... Stoke, Stoke Newton's Newton. still a shithole, to be fair. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> still well, a shithole. What's ironic about Stoke Newton is now, it's how it's splendid, because 
in terms of, you know, you've got some of the worst estates built around it and you've got houses at three million pound plus, yeah. you know, scattered throughout it, you know. So you've got this mad combination of people moving into the area and also you've still got the underlying problems that sit there, you know, with kids and gangs and poverty. Yet you've got wealth, you know, which is becoming it's so um, dominant in the area now yeah. by looking at the shops and the things. So you've got the divide, which, I, you know, there must be a middle ground. Middle and middle ground is important. So, yeah, back to the story, I guess. So there I was at school, sort of, you know, messing around, moving away from school, left school, kicked out of school rather, with no education, and uh, started off this parties, doing the journeys with parties and stuff. My parents tried to drag me back in. <clears throat> they used to, uh, you know, hardworking people, bought properties. My dad was a builder. He'd renovate and My mum would, you know, they'd utilise those, rent those properties in these kind of areas, Hackney, Stoke Newington, around that borough. And uh, eventually they decided to buy a shop, an off-licence, and wanted then me to, you know, and my sister to run this off-licence, which they wanted to turn into a chain of off-licences eventually. This would have been their aspiration for me. Of course, I found better fun <laughs> hanging around, and then I started thinking, well, a bad idea to sell a bit of drugs because they were quite available in the area. And in the parties, I'm guessing everyone was taking them. Mm, yeah, it was back then you know so okay. it was basically you know people again Palestinian people you know class A drugs is very very really used you know it's unheard of almost because someone putting something up the nose was taking a tablet in our culture is really badly looked down at yeah. you know it wasn't until 87 that one day some friends came into the shop and said look because I had a sound system we're having this kind of this party this acid house rave you know can you do the sound system for it and I was like, yeah, no problem. What is it? Where is it? It was in Bethnal Green. A small so did you build a name up for being like the main guy for sound systems and yeah, stuff like that? Yeah, because that you, that's yeah? what I'd done. I loved it. It was what I'd done. It was a career to me because you understood you know, how to operate these things technically. I understood you know, how it worked. And uh, I wasn't a bad music selector at that, at that time. I moved across from reggae into rare groove and actually then DJed on that circuit for a while. When the crossover came to Acid House, you know, I wasn't going to become a DJ in that, in, that, in that era, but I saw the opportunity as a promoter. Yeah. And uh, once the light bulbs went on, I saw them, um, you know, the people coming through and what it could be away from ecstasy, it became an opportunity that I thought, well, I've been doing this for like, you know, five years, kicking off doors, going into illegal buildings, let's try to go into some warehouses. And Hackney, dominantly Hackney East End, was an area that had been brought down by Thatcher because it was a very working class area, lots of factories, they were all getting closed down and people were concentrating on the stock market and it was all about wealth at that time. Um, so we moved in, you know, we started to break into warehouses, put on events, the events became hugely successful. How many people would turn up to one of these events? We, we, we mushroomed, we literally blew out. We started for like 300 people and we were getting 8,000 within a space of six weeks. Wow. You know, we blew it out of the sky. What so you were doing proper events? Oh, not proper even events. This we, took like... it, we took over. We closed the West End down, you know, and to make a statement like that, That's it's factual. Move. Today, our first flyer is in the um, London Modern History Museum. Oh, seriously? Yeah, seriously. Exhibited right now. If you go there, it's oh, in wow. the Docklands. You go there, look for Genesis Chapter 1. It sits right there. You know, that year, 88, we were voted number one event in the um, Melody, uh, Eminem, uh, the Melody Maker New Music Express uh, paper, which was the number one music industry publication as the best event of that year. So, you know, we were young kids, but we were really taking it down in a massive, massive way. And uh, that was the beginning, really. As I said, the parties became massive. We Was match- you making money? fortunes at that time yeah. given given how long ago it was as well and as a young person uh the revenue we were taking from the emission even though emission was it started at five went up to tenners but obviously the drinks were you know you sold soft drinks a pound a tin i think a tin of coke back there was about 20 pence to buy Fuck. you know they were a quid you know a bottle of water was about seven or eight pence or something like that to buy they were a quid do you know what i mean and people were obviously with dehydration are taking yeah. ecstasy they drink and they drink and they drink so This video is sponsored by Cranbrook Law, an award-winning immigration law firm. Their talented solicitors can help when any struggles arise regarding immigration law. They can help get you the visas they need. They can help get you the staff you need from any other countries. 
as you can see, the website is on the screen right now. So if you need anything to do with immigration law, message Cranbrook Law and let them help you. Whether you're looking to obtain a sponsor license, receive advice and guidance in relation to compliance and our civil penalties, or take advantage of our know-how and experience across a broad range of business visas, our talented and dynamic immigration lawyers are available to speak to you. Telephone numbers on the screen, emails on the screen, and hit the link in the bio if you need any help. And did police never get on your case for that? Because obviously they're well, illegal parties. We were incredibly cunning. You could understand this was pre anything they'd seen before because traditionally what used to happen was uh, when people put a party on and the police arrived, everyone would run, including yeah. Dan and Hyde. But we kind of done something different. I met a guy called Tony Cousin Hater who went on to do the sunrise parties, but he was this upper class privileged kind of kid who was well spoken. His mother, father, was, I think, was a lawyer. So he understood it a little bit differently. And some of the people now we've started to come in contact with were actually not running away from the police but actually embracing the police in a very cunning way by even though they're completely illegal yeah. by you know creating bogus leases and telling oh, the police shit. to do music business parties you know and the police were oblivious to this stuff so my partner in the party so I brought into it Wayne he was you know pretty good at you know uh, pulling the wool over the police's eyes so it's to stick him out front you know well dressed yeah, and yeah. you'd have a clipboard there and uh, we'd have all these names of all these pop stars Elton John George Michael all across just for face value and when the police would arrive what would traditionally do was um, say to them you know, say, I said close what Dan this is a music industry party this was Channel 4 and they'd be like what so they'd have all these bogus Channel 4 head uh, letterheads and yeah, all yeah. these because you used to go into the estate agents in a day ask to look at some properties you know the sheets and stuff and then go back cut the letter head off the top of it okay. stick that on a piece of paper type out this letter to say we've leased the property photocopy that and have that as a body for at least yeah. then we do the channel form or whatever you know sort of logo again do this guest list for this music video supposed music video when the police has arrived they get starstruck because they're seeing all these you know artists on there we've had situations where the police have literally parked cars you know and i'm not bullshitting you and ask for autographs you know we had them no. like that it was like insane you know it was just a comical <laughs> ex it was it was absolutely comical and we were young there wasn't really serious consequences at that time to it and we just you know went ahead and done it and you know it was it, it created a, a movement which i can only describe as it was the biggest thing since punk rock and probably you know years to come will be the biggest uh, youth movement of culture and fashion you know yeah, ever yeah. to happen in this country so it's something, as I said, uh, it started, I think, you know, as, as something really, really good. And it top up black and white together, all colours, all nations. You know, people I know, Asian film producer I know right now, he said to me, if I hadn't, you know, have, have gone to your parties, I wouldn't be a film producer now. He's a very credited film producer. And he said, you know, I went to university to do, you know, civil engineering. You know, it's my parents from, from Bangladesh yeah, yeah. that put me in to do this. And I went to part and I met people who were in the film industry and they introduced me into the film industry and I became a director. You know, and there's a million stories like that. So people were going into different avenues of employment they'd never think about, especially in, to, you know, arts, culture, things like this. So we were responsible for a lot of very positive things, but also, so there was a you know a flip side to that coin you know drugs were becoming you know commonly used it was the i would say the gateway drug it crossed over um people who would never ordinarily take drugs took uh which was a class a drug drug dealers you know prior to that were criminals you know a drug dealer was a guy that had to be connected if it was selling puff he had to be connected yeah, yeah. selling class they definitely connected but ecstasy done something different it meant group of people going to parties you know 10 of them because you used to go there in, in herds of people and they'd say oh can you get a good pill and someone would say yeah i can get good pills and he'd go to someone suddenly he gets 10 or 20 for his friends he's getting his drugs for free now yeah. so he starts yeah, off yeah. like that and then suddenly you know he's going out monday tuesday wednesday he's thinking shit i've missed work three times but if he goes and gets himself 100 pills, he can sell them to his friends, make his money that he'd be getting, you know, doing his job as the postman or whatever he'd be doing, cover his bills or cover his mortgage. And then it escalated from there. So that whole generation of what I call social dealer, I guess we were kind of partly responsible for, you know, developing that, I, I suppose, which of course then changed. Was from... your team doing any of the dealing in the parties? No, not at all. Uh, so we were, to doing, start, you we were just... doing parties. I moved into that. I moved into the manufacturing mass distribution of it. You know, I took, took that upon myself. Um, that was something I'd done, but that was really 
after the parties had stopped. So how we kind of moved that journey was just quite interesting because uh, we were made target number one. Our security firm that we had on board, a lot of them guys were dominantly from the inner city football firm, ICF. Yeah, yeah. And what happened was they brought their own uh, attention, let's say, from the police. Um, especially the parties were in East London, a lot of these police were familiarised with them and knew them as troublemakers. So that was becoming a bit of a target for us. Yeah. Um, and then there was word, obviously, that some of the security were moving into other parties, other people's events, and they were um, persuading them to do their security, to put it in a nice way. And uh, then it was open that maybe we were involved in extortion rackets. And of course, uh, what happens is if you're organising these parties, you're going to be looked at as a target, a person you've got responsible Definitely. for it. So we had that sort of target on our back. And then um, we decided when the parties were getting constantly closed down, uh, we opened a ticket um, out there which was called London Dance Tickets because all the big events were happening still, Sunrise, Biology, all very good friends of ours. So we could obviously sell their tickets, yeah. which made complete sense. And you already um, had a following as well. A a massive, yeah. Everyone knew who Genesis was. And then the ticket agency we opened was um, uh, some people we knew, a car front they had, which was on Bow Church Lane, the Hunt Brothers, you know. And obviously they became... Um, the place was under surveillance for a long period of time, unbeknown to <laughs> yeah. us. Um, and what happened was we became prime targets and there were bugs in our office there was bugs in their office in the car front next door and this huge police corruption case was being built up and you know this organized crime thing was going on um in in, in the eyes of the police and uh as i said i kind of um became one of these targets uh and i'd got an um you know police coming through my door um one morning basically thank god i wasn't there and they were investigating a couple of murders and some other sort of stuff and it was just closing in a little bit too much for me so i decided it was a good time to leave the country did you know what was going on at this point obviously as you mean when you was part of that the brothers mm. you knew what was happening right well who knows what is happening you know the police doesn't even know what's happening That's you true. know all these things it, you've got to stay with many, many things that were intelligence led and these you know devices are put into in the places anyone can come into your place of business and they can say anything it doesn't yeah. mean you're part yeah, of that, yeah, no, that's true. you know but ultimately you know you you know you, you find yourself in a hotbed and obviously around that whole scene at the time you know we were we were a target already um i think those particular group of people as well was also becoming quite a serious target at that time they were coming up you know on, on, on the um you know on the radar of the police in a big way and it was just a combination basically of a uh, of you know a combustion of madness but as i said i decided to leave where did you go i went to jamaica you know nice. when i slipped to paris i stayed in paris for about three months went from paris i slipped into miami on false passport i laid down low in miami for about four months then i fell into jamaica where i had very very good connections um, and very powerful contacts and then i sort of sat back there um i had what you could call a bit of an um you know a, a wild life i'd have to say i was a young man enjoying myself um i had two I ended up with two relationships the first um was with a, a daughter of a prominent politician i have a son with her who's my eldest boy um unfortunately that relationship was you know wasn't going to work and she unfortunately died of breast cancer when i was oh, in wow. prison Sorry and my son that followed was with um who i married she was a miss jamaica world and uh you know that was quite a so if someone is supposed to keep in a really low profile you know <laughs> bit, i was putting myself bait. on the front page of the newspaper every single day in jamaica which wasn't really great but you know when that sort of again the relationship sort of unfortunately didn't work out and it kind of led me to have a lot of time on my hands and then i sort of took the decision to delve into smuggling i started off bringing in cars that was a big thing because i was able to circumvent the duty which you pay huge duty and taxes of vehicles in jamaica i was able to get them from england and then obviously had people who could obviously you know um, calculate the duties and yeah, got yeah. lower as an assessment of what they should be so i was making money from that but what i was doing I was building up contacts of the wolf build up contacts with the docks meant obviously i had access to the docks and a family friend i describe as um, extended family he was a senior member of the eastern caribbean cartel and he kind of became aware of what i was starting to do and he kind of just didn't want me to go on that road because he knew i'd probably up dead because you're building a bit of walking name. into that direction you have to do it so he just took me on the wing and said look you know you're getting up dead here because you don't know what you're doing you know you're playing a very dangerous game what i'm going to do is I'm retired, but I'm going to allow you to, you know, to access to some people. And he did. 
allowed me to access that gateway that gave me complete control into the docks to the airports and also you know um, people abroad in South America and in the Caribbean so that network I tapped into and um, I started to use it to my full advantage and what was you smuggling well I started smuggling was obviously you know the jug of choice and we had multiple uh, methods of getting it here you know we had people that i knew had worked at the market spitterfields which was a very popular place to be because all perishable goods come through there come from every country in the world so it meant we could you know circumvent most of those companies that were down now and of course being perishable goods that has to get cleared straight away otherwise they'll perish at the docks so we had a great system you know with clearing stuff that stuff with how much like how much talking if we're talking about well we used to de describe it in pounds because it worked not a metric system you see so like 2.2 yeah, .2 pounds is a kilo so we smuggle it on average the biggest shipments would be about ten thousand pounds which is about five metric tons wow um yeah so very portionate sizes Super. of stuff and <laughs> so that's uh, kind of bullshit you're in big 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 amounts of no wind. yeah we played at the very highest level there was yeah you know yeah it wasn't a game anymore this was a serious business is, <laughs> and uh yeah and then obviously that moved into other drugs class a drugs uh coming across from south america and uh it, it it became a very big business and eventually we obviously were making lots of money we had opportunity so we were able to actually get a team of corrupt customs officers mm -hmm. uh you know on the payroll Serious. and that changed the game because it meant we no longer had to circumvent the shipments we could actually send it direct. pay them off and clear them yeah anywhere in the world so we were you know we could put we could put an elephant on a container and get it cleared literally. You know I mean? so literally so that was obviously the gateway to hell because when you're playing at that level it then means that obviously you know you're you're you, you're better noticed by the dea Nothing by interpol well. by metro by international law enforcement not just customs and excise not just you know the um uh, regular police or drug squad or you got everyone watching you everyone globally is watching you you know so it was a matter of time before there was going to be some sort of um problem or issue with and that. how long was you at this for how long was you deep involved in this one i felt like i had at least i would say from i guess from about 1996 uh solidly to 2006 when i was arrested for half a ton of so 10 game. years 10 years yeah clear 10 years so question you can answer it if you want but street value how much would you say you smuggled in in total Street value, you know, because yeah, that's always time to describe the figure to me in turn around and they calculated a, a, a value. I think they calculated a value of uh, um, a kilo of 100,000 pounds. And I was like, What street do you sell those? <laughs> because I really wish I knew. I wish you know I knew. I mean? because I'll be on that I, street. If I knew, right? <laughs> but um, <laughs> let's put it like this it's very, very hard to put a figure on it. But when I was arrested in 2006, the one single shipment. They'd arrested us for had a strip of a hundred million pounds, and that was for the that was for a, a, that was a, a consignment of just five hundred kilos, um, which they seized. But there was additional seizure made in Venezuela of well three hundred sealed to the bottom of a container with an additional three hundred when the army went and uh, realised the floor was a little bit kind Force. of newly laid concrete, and they found another three hundred fifty kilos ready to go in that one. So there was about a ton of total they got but 500 kilos they managed to seize on the floor here so a lot of coke mm, yeah by any standard i suppose it was probably at that time i suppose allegedly and i always use the words allegedly because i was never convicted you see um i suppose if you put it on a basis if you were getting a ton of so on average a month okay you know it's 12 months a year so if you're talking about 12 tons of at that specific time, we were probably responsible for a quarter of all the drugs coming to England. When you actually think of it like that, that's a bit fucked, no? It's bigger than Tesco's. Yeah. It's <laughs> a business. That's bigger a, than Boots Pharmacists. That's yeah. not a joke. That's, yeah. that's you, You're deeply involved in that. That's a big, big, big amount yeah. of... And it's busy. And that's what it is. It's who, also, you know, <laughs> whatever you're going to do, you know, you go, you know, you go large, you go home, right? If you're in it, you know, you've got to be in it. If and how many members were part of your team? Because um, it weren't just again, you, was again, it? Again, this is a really, really strange thing because there are no members. So when people create these organised crime groups, what they talk about, there is no such thing as a, as a single organised crime group because the whole idea of being involved in international smuggling is you work with multiple syndicates. Yeah, true. And, you know, those syndicates change and cartels as well. When people talk about cartels, it really laugh at the idea of it because there are prominent 
so-called cartels they're just regions of people yeah. and regions of people aren't necessarily gangsters a lot of them are business people yeah. who happen to have access to have access to money for legitimate business who want to make some more money who will put some money into a you know in, into a shipment there are people who have very good gateways in terms of some of the companies they own and they decide to obviously allow their companies to be used you know for access yeah. these will all be people who are members of a cartel if you believe what the intelligence and the police say but these are just people at the end of the day who are actually doing another business the the business happens to be illegal opposed to being legal i was just saying i can't remember who it says it says i'm not a, i'm not a criminal i'm a businessman and my business is crime bobby cummins is that who is, yeah yeah and, and it's true it's very very true but it's also a flip side to it because it's easily said than done you know because if you are looking at crime as a business you have to be controlled you have to have discipline you know, a lot of people do it for the bravado and for the fun. And for, until it goes wrong, until you're in a massive prison sentence or someone gets shot or you get shot, you know, then it's reality. It all comes home. Your chicken's coming to roost. But in all honesty, anything you do, you have to do discipline. Now, what's going on, guys? This video is sponsored by London Steel Services Limited, based in Hertfordshire on the A10. No job too small, no job too big. Anything to do with metal, these are your guys. Make sure you hit up London Steel Services Limited. All their information is on the screen right now. They offer crazy lead times, 24 to 48 hours on builders, beams, and small fabrication jobs. Flatbed and 45 to 90 foot crane high ab deliveries. The jobs they get involved with are barn conversions, extensions, loft conversions, new builds. They can survey, design, supply and install steel or simply just supply. Whatever you need, they're here to help. I changed my life in prison on the last sentence and I made a conscious decision that I wasn't going to go down this road anymore. How long was your last sentence for? 15 years. Wow, so and my yeah, big time. My choice though was to look at it and say, you know what, I can do more changing the system in a positive way than doing what I'm doing and destroying it. And it was conscience got me. Conscience got me. My parents were community leaders. They were great people who helped their communities. And I saw what I was doing was destroying them. You know, I remember when I was sentenced, and this was really ironic. When I was sentenced, the prosecutor, before you know, putting it forward to the judge, said this man's responsible for hundreds of murders. You know, destroying thousands of lives. And I was laughing at this guy. I think we're an idiot. You know, where's all this? I've got one body on me. Do you know what I mean? And when I went in prison in Belmarsh, and I started these young guys coming through every single day, lots of them on joint enterprise, all for murders. And I was thinking to myself, these guys are out there selling drugs. Inevitably, I never thought I got my hands dirty because I didn't because people I was wholesaling them to weren't street kids they weren't guys on the road but that drugs was coming back down it was going on the road and if I was involved in you know I would describe it as powdered coke which was a business party thing and you know people in these industries and who had money would spend the money in it but no if it was pure coke it was going to get washed down it was going to go in the pot it was going to go on the street and there were going to be thousands of families suffering there were going to be kids who couldn't get their milk there were going to be nappies not being got for kids there were going to be women prostituting themselves there were going to be guys going and stealing them people would become the dregs of the societies we look at it okay and people i would even look at that time look down at and i was yet as a cause for that but i couldn't see that i was the because you're involved in that circle because you're involved in it and until you, you accept take a it yeah you accept it you know and no one accepts it you know i was in the white moor which is life as prison you know I, I don't know, we had like 2,000 years of sentences, you know, in 40 cells, you know, if you start calculating prison time, yeah. And it was, the reality was, everyone is innocent. No one's done a murder. No one's committed a crime. It's like, you, everyone's telling themselves they ain't done it. And we all do it as criminals because we go to court and we tailor our defence accordingly to, you know, what the, the prosecutor gives us. Then we get so far into our defence, even if we're found guilty, we've convinced ourselves that we're innocent. Yeah, you believe you your know? own lies. And I had to wake myself up one day. I was like, what the fuck am I thinking? Like, of course I'm guilty. Of yeah. course I've done all this shit and loads more. Do you know what I mean? So when you accept it, you didn't start to change. My acceptance, I don't think I'm a silly guy. I think I'm a relatively clever guy. And I look at things, what is the practicality, what is the outcome, what can be achieved? And I realise that in any study, 10,000 hours of learning makes you an expert in a field, okay? Now, if I'm going to spend 24 hours a day in prison, it means 10 hours a day minimum, I can take in my surroundings and understand, learn what's going on. Yeah. And I figured if I can get 10,000 hours of <coughs> understanding the prison system i can become an expert in that field which is just over three years so if it's 365 days in a year you're talking about 3650 learning hours yeah. in three years you've got over 11,000 hours so i spent three years can 
conditioned myself to move through the systems, which is category A, category B, category C, category D, which when I went through every system in the prison system that exists in this country today, and worked in different departments from we, you know, from the resettlement with prospects, you know, from um, activity hub to know what workplace people going to get. I become a listener to understand the safe custody unit worked, and I looked at all the placements there were because I knew I'd come out and I looked at a multi-billion pound industry and I thought to myself I'm doing this I'm going to set up a charity today I come out of prison I'm going to fix some of these problems with common sense solutions I'm going to employ people who are coming out of jail like me with lived experience and I'm going to eventually in 10 years have the biggest charity in the criminal justice system and that was my mindset you um, know at, and at the end of the day one thing I will say was even though no matter what you done was crime as in importing exporting whatever it is you had to be smart to do that I'm and now you're day. and now you're using your brain in a positive way mm. i think the results are there do you know what i mean is in what you've done already from what you're saying it's going to be one of the biggest charity this is that it's there it's, it's simple inevitable. and it's simple the worst thing is you know and, and this is what i try to instill in young people as well so what we do as a charity and organization we off opportunity you know anyone can go so don't do it it's like if I'm a young guy and someone tells me to stop <laughs> Don't selling do. drugs, say, oh, I'm getting two grand a week. You can give me that? Yeah, do you know what I mean? True. How are you gonna get... So unless you've got a solution to a problem, okay, you can then start to make a difference, okay? So I offer, I do entrepreneur schools, basically, okay? Yeah. So I look at kids, they're a drug dealer, you're an entrepreneur, full stop. You're selling a product which you can't advertise, can't promote, yeah. it's got to be kept underground, you sell it out, you know, you, you, you sell all your stock easily and quickly. So if you could do that with drugs, why can't you find a legitimate product you can do the same with as long as you understand the basic principles of business how a business person looks at business you know by doing a SWOT analysis strength weaknesses opportunities you look at it and think this is a business if it's making t-shirts if it's selling coffee it doesn't matter as long as you've got someone that's got to give you that guide in hand to take you through those initial steps then you're potentially on your path to being an entrepreneur, a businessman, yeah. you know, kickstarting the economy, being a contributing member to society. And you changed it from this evil side of the coin to a positive side of the coin. I'm not saying it's easy because it's really bloody hard. But through these eyes, I look at it and I see it as something I know how to do it. So that, you know, that formula that you've got, you can, you can just bottle it and give it to people to do. Yeah. And it works, you know. But you went from earning, let's just say, millions, yeah? I don't know how many millions you were making, but you were making millions. You were turning yeah. over hundreds of millions mm -hmm. in that game. I don't know, but I doubt you're making that now, yeah? Oh, definitely not. So how do you program your brain? Because everyone wants the glitz and glam, yeah? yeah? When you're making all that money, you can do what you want. You can make a phone call. I want this, want that, want this, want that. That's a good life in some people's eyes. Yeah. And that's what all these young boys are chasing. They Absolutely. want it. That is yeah. all they want. They want to be able to get the best watches, Absolutely. drive the Lambos. Yeah. How have you now programmed your brain to say, you know what? I don't need that shit. Okay. Very easily. Do you know how easy it is? All that shit will inevitably end up two ways. Okay. Dead One way everything. is dead. Okay. Because yeah. your competition will take you out. You're getting some sort of madness, not even your own grief, and you could end up dead very easily. Or the most obvious route okay which 90% will hit is prison when you arrive in prison you're living on 12 pounds a week okay you could be living on for 10 years so if you can condition your mind to live on 12 pound a week which all of them can do 20 pound max okay doesn't matter how many millions you've got on the outside and believe me this is for everybody there's no unconditional there are 85,000 people in prisons 120 prisons in England and Wales okay and every person no how much money you've got on the outside you're living on 20 pound a week it's mad, isn't it? For as many years as you're given, okay? So if you can do that, you can condition your mind to live on what you've got. Yeah, when you, but when you think of it like that, it's a lot It's a lot easier said than done. No, it's a simply said than done because it's a fact. If you deal with facts, yeah, true, true. you cannot true. challenge facts. True, I hear you. I so I got you, I, I? I, Yeah, I can't, really, <laughs> I can't really knock that one because you know what it is? Us, even me, I'm a young guy. No matter how much money we make, it's not enough. In our head, it's not enough. No. And there was a thing that I saw once and said, it's not how much money you earn, it's how much money you spend. Yeah, but also and how much money you save. Of course, 100%. And that leads up to my question with, how much did the police confiscate of you? My confiscation order was quite mild. It was £1.3 million and some properties, you know. Um, now, in the big scheme of things, had I been um, found guilty and convicted of the my confiscation order would have been upwards of 100 million pounds. So talk to us of that, that 
main thing because that was a that was a big case. Yeah, that was not a. That's I think we haven't touched on that enough. That was a big big case at the end of the day. That yeah. was it, people have made movie of it, no? Yeah, at the time it was the biggest um, drugs seizure um, in you know central in, in London. Full stop. You know, uh, actually landed and what was you know it was effectively cleared. Um, it was the biggest shipment. Of in, Did the police the allow country. that to get cleared? No. What happened was in the strangest bizarrest twist of fate was um we had a team of corrupt custom officers who were clearing our containers and uh one of my co-defendants he was a very lively character let's just put it like that and uh he basically in he had no reason to be involved in the business his parents were very wealthy <laughs> yeah. who had a very large company in the uh, market but he enjoyed the excitement of it i've convinced myself it was a buzz for him you know so he wasn't happy, you know, working with the one facility which we had and which we worked incredibly well. He wanted to punt the services elsewhere. And, you know, he did obviously offered the services somewhere else, which wasn't customs, which was the services of the market. The police were on this particular group of people he was in communication with. Effectively, they picked up on everyone's phones. And when the shipment was cleared, uh, they picked up a conversation that, the, the, the stuff had landed even though the particular shipment he was talking about wasn't even on the water yet but it was confusing them to understand why has it landed when it hasn't even left yeah. Panama and uh, they went in their undivised wisdom to the market the, to the uh, wolf that night they turned up at Tilbury Docks and they randomly started to search containers they couldn't find anything which you know to their amusement they was like where is it because they're talking about it being cleared and then they decided to look at the cleared containers and uh, they went to one of the clear containers going to the market and literally half a ton of fell out at the back of the container onto them all. And uh, it was like, well, how on earth could this have been cleared? So there was the problem because you Was this not the thing that was in the coconuts? It was, not, it was not in coconuts. It was the coconuts were simply a cover load. So the container, the container was, was in bags, square blocks in bags so where, where did this coconut circular. thing come from because the cover load was coconut so the coconuts were coming from Guyana and the actual um obviously the, 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 it was just you had to put something called a bill of laden okay yeah, yeah. we didn't worry about the shapes or the densities because you we were paying to get them cleared so what the team was doing was they were putting it through they were marking out for x-ray so when the containers used to leave they used to just simply give them the container number they would put it into the system to say that they have interest in it, which stopped the Coast Guard from intervening on board and ship at sea. So when it arrived here, what they didn't do is they pull it away for X-ray. Of course, it'd be moved from the um, from the container ship into an area of X-ray. At that time, the X-ray system was a lorry. The lorry was a long vehicle. It had yeah. what it called boom arm over the top of it. One officer would get out, jump, make sure that, the, that it was on level ground. Second one would sit into the uh, back of it where there was a computer screen. And the boom arm would then go across from the front of the container to the back of the container and it would x-ray everything inside of it. Well, of course, back then, all you had to do was say there's nothing in there. You didn't have to take a photograph of it, just say it's done, cleared, boom. Yeah. Give us a stamp, say the x it's gone for x-ray, take it to a cleared side of the wharf. You send up transport company, they take it, bring it to where you're taking it to, unload it, you're gone. And that was the system. It was so easy to circumvent, that's how it was done. So we had control over that facility, um, and that was how we was getting our containers through. But as I said, a different team from an elite unit who had been looking, obviously, at my co-defendant, they went down there, found this and realised there was no way on earth that they could have cleared that. actually cleared that. But it was a question of arresting a load of customs officers at the Wolf, okay? And by doing that, there was a great chance of us going free, but it would also set about thousands of appeals because all the people who had, you know, claimed that they'd been set up by the customs and it wasn't their drugs coming through the docks would all have an instant appeal. And then if they are given yes. an appeal, it would put great stress on the criminal justice system in terms of paying for all these cases. But more importantly, imagine the hundreds of millions, if not billions of pounds in confiscation orders they've confiscated, or would it be repayable with interest? It would be enough to take the whole criminal justice system down overnight. So, you know, an undivided wisdom, they made their decision to collude together and, you know, sort of put the train in one direction, which was going to be all clubbed together, say so they made this great discovery of all these drugs and they've arrested these seven evil men. And that was how they went to trial. And of course, we were fucked. We were in shit creek without a paddle. And uh, as you know, you can never underestimate the someone's greed. 
you know the people then this elite team that were now heading the investigation they were getting access to public interest immunity documents which was surveillance and intel intel logs they'd had from all different agencies all around the world over a period of three and a half years and they were looking at documents and one document i believe turned them was in one of them stated that one of my co-defendants had nine million pounds in euros and us dollars hidden in the boot of his car in east london somewhere and you know for a guy who's getting i don't know thirty thousand a year doing terrible shifts of overtime you know watching guys like me going in and out with you know restaurants and having lovely cars and lots of houses or he's sitting with a long lens camera eat drinking cold coffee and eating cold sandwiches isn't nice no. so you know they thought to themselves the other lots obviously deeply involved for it to clear and that was it an approach was made they went a quarter of a million quid and uh, i obliged effectively you know they went in stole all the documents which bii documents ironically you know uh, i'm ashamed to say it but at the time it was literally funny i used got someone to create a rubber stamp for me which was uh but them things you used to get done yeah, yeah. used to have i think it was rule 39 or 59 it was it was it was um it was listed as rule anyway they couldn't open legal papers so what i was doing was getting the documents basically sent in to me in a4 envelopes with this rubber stamp on so the screws in a prison were actually delivering me these intelligence documents to my cell by hand and what was so funny was uh, particularly two officers I used to read couldn't stand their guts every time they were taking these papers down they used to volunteer to take them to me because they thought it was more disclosure coming yeah, and yeah. it was more pressure on me and when I used to get them I used to look at oh no man I can't believe it not more disclosure and they'd be smiling and laughing I'd take the sub piss myself laughing when I went back into the cell break them open and it was funny because at that time at Wandsworth um, to piss me off, what they'd done was they moved me away from my co-defendants. Where on where on B wing, I think A wing, right? Because I was very troublesome with the officers. <laughs> yeah. And they put, I've come into the cell one day. Who's sitting in the cell? Uh, Henry Freegar. This is the guy they made a film about the other day called a Rogue Agent. Yeah, yeah. He's, he plans to be MI five agent. Huge story basically. And uh, he tricked all these people. You know, these women told him he was working for the MI5, and uh, you know, it's, it's an amazing story. You can see the film; it's on Netflix at the moment. You know, and uh, when I was, I was like, "What the fuck?" But then, because he studied so much and made himself this fantasy MI5 agent, when his documents come through, he was the perfect person to help me tailor the defence. Because of course, we had to be able to put something, you know, into place, and. Uh, there it was, I had my defence. You know. And what was your defence? Cigars. I said I was smuggling cigars. You know, because of course I'd spent a lot of time in Cuba. I knew the price of Cohiba's cigars of such kinds. And of course, what the police done was, rather than probably letting the case go through, because I was terrified if corruption was already involved in the case, that we could act, maybe access to the cocaine as we've got on the street. They went with, while well, the shift wasn't on, got loads of blocks of wood, probably scaffolding boards, I presume, sawed them into you know blocks of this size wrapped them all up in masking tape and put them in bags so when you see the photographs they you know these these bags come out of square blocks like that so to any sensible thinking person they look just like a box of cuban cigars and of course how would i know if they're coming in a seal bag and i don't actually touch them or have contact with them Equally, you know, if you smuggle cigars, if they are counterfeit cigars, you would need customs because obviously you're evading, you know, duty and excise. You're bringing in counterfeit goods. And you got away with that case? Yeah, everyone did. Whose was the then? Well, it wasn't mine, was it? But who's were the, who, what was your defence? It just... must have been the customs. Fuck. Listen, fair enough. Fair, fair enough. And in the police's head... They thought, yeah, you fucking smart fucker. Exactly did, yeah. Exactly right. And fair play to them. Yeah, of you course. know, I've been playing this game for 20 years, you know, having them outside warehouses from the age of 20 years old, parking people's cars, you know, doing shit like that. You know, eventually it was embarrassment. It was a great embarrassment. I was an embarrassment to British law enforcement. They, I was embarrassing them. This guy, you know, comes from nowhere, particularly being mixed race, wasn't going to be a great ticket for him. You know what I mean? <laughs> and doing all this for shit real. and just getting away with it. You know, eventually, you know, it, it had to stop. And it pisses them off as well. And it pisses them off. But look, you know, I'm not going to be that person that's saying, you know what, anti-police, because I was anti-police. But at the end of the day, you've got to have police to have some sort of law and order. 
in any society. Because yeah. if something happens, you know, <laughs> someone breaks into the biggest criminal's ass or, you know, does any kind of shit, yeah, he's not going for the local crackhead to fix the problem. Mm. You could phone the police and say, listen, fucking this bit broke my car, stole my car, yeah. okay? All right, exception, you might try to do it on your own, yeah. okay? But this reality <laughs> of every... How many people have done it on their own? <laughs> yeah? yeah, for real. But in this reality... 99% of people, Thank when they please. get to a certain level in their life, they think to themselves, to go and deal with that person or that individual, it's more it's headache worth than it's it. worth. Yeah, it's not worth it. Do you know what I mean? And that's the reality of it, you know? So, how I see it, my head was in a different space. You know, I was a guy that I went too far. You know, I didn't know when to stop. There is a limit, but if you don't understand that what you're causing, the damage. So, starting off, I saw no damage in what I was doing. But as it got on, you know, I still didn't see the damage. But maybe I did. Maybe I was conscious of it. Maybe I didn't accept it. But the word conscience is the big one. When your conscience becomes your guide, you take you have conscience on board. There's only so many things you can do yeah, and feel comfortable doing them. But you lot were importing a lot. Well, allegedly importing a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's very, very hard to actually take a step back and think fuck no me. it's impossible because also your contacts are broad you're making them hundreds of millions of pounds you know they they will send you as much as you want because why wouldn't they of course. you know um you've got access you've got you know people want to sell this stuff you're making a lot of people rich you know you're making a lot of people rich you know guys who are getting opportunities to you know you supply them you know they're coming up suddenly they're coming up from a little crappy car into a bentley they're coming up yeah. into a little council flat into a six bedroom house yeah. you know so you're making money, lots you're of making, people richer you yeah, know well, like you're doing small amounts you're doing you're doing tons, tons so yeah. people Metric are getting tons. people are becoming multi 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 yeah. multi millionaires yeah so no one's going to tell you to slow down no, no they're no, going to say let's do encourage more encourage you come let's get going yeah let's, instead of a yeah. ton a month let's do two ton yeah. let's do three ton yeah yeah but when you was in prison that all changed well, yeah, my eyes opened and stuff. So, what was first, the what was the big what was the fifteen years for? Uh, okay, so fifteen years was for a small amount of which a small I was, amount, a small amount six kilos. Okay, what, fifteen years, fifteen years, That's incredible. Sick. Well, I'll tell you something else, which is completely the maddest thing. If ever there's a if there's a story to come around and change <laughs> your life, this is it. So I got fifteen years for a, what should have been a six year sentence. Okay. Anyway, that was the first, obviously, hard tablet. Um, and that was obviously for political justice as well, because this time now, it had come around, obviously, that I'd, you know, been involved in corruption and the papers and stuff like that. But I nearly got away as well. I got hung during the first trial. Mm. And then to show how they were, they arrested my solicitor. You know, that, yeah, it's insane. So the levels they were going to, what they was basically oh. saying was, you know, the gloves are off. You know, anyone that fucks with this guy or represents this guy, we're fucking you know, up. we're going to fuck you up. And that was a signal that was sent, which was really, really clear, you know. And, you know, I hit a brick wall with that one. But, you know, luckily, I kind of, and they would have kept coming as well, the relative. If I kept going, they would have kept coming. But I thought to myself, I'm going to do something here you're not going to fucking expect. And the problems in the prisons were massive with kids coming in from postcode gang issues. And the nature of postcode gangs are there's an enemy on every corner. Yeah, and what everyone fails to tell these young people is when you go around and you create that kind of drama and I'm watch, terrible business model because it's a question of you can't do business with people you should be doing business with if you're a drug dealer that's your principle yep. be able to move freely and do business with other people so that's basically bad business model number one number two killing someone is a life sentence and it's a wreck as well okay so think of that one killing people is bad for business that's bad number two and of course number three is the enemies you never created when you used to go to prison in the 50s 60s and 70s and whenever you know prison it was armed robbers there was whoever there was even drug smugglers but you all knew each other and you were all friends and it was all fun yeah, yeah. you land in prison today Fucked. you've got a fucking enemy in every corner and don't tell me you've killed someone's cousin or relative or closest friend they're letting that slide because they're not Okay, and it's going to escalate. And you know, when you're in dispersal systems, the nicest tool you can go and get is a tin of tuna, get your nail clipper, take that, create a jagged edge blade, and you can slice something up nicely with one of those. You know, and believe me, they're only getting sliced every single day. And that's a mild, that's a mild treatment. So if you're going to live like that and you're going to put yourself in an environment, just think about what you're doing before you do it. Now, I picked it up straight away. These kids, you know, they don't want to really kill anyone. 
but they have to do it because they they feel that it's it's imposed upon them because they can get in the story of what the other side's like what Joel's yeah. like then they're going for a scenario of they definitely don't want to get killed or hurt right they don't want to do that so that's another thing they don't make clear then of course the other one is they don't want to spend the rest of their life in prison no one does because no one does right so when you've got those three things which creates combustion what do you do first thing is fear they feel fear and this is where you have to try to change that and the change in that narrative is okay I said to the safe custody governor because I was getting sick of it listen every second we're getting closed down here right every minute and you're a category of prisoner last thing you want is to be locked up in your cell constantly because the kids are fighting the activities are closed down and now the guards are getting in, injured in the issues so they're now starting to look at it differently and me and a friend of mine who's double a category prisoner actually he's just come out of the unit he's done 13 years in now he had uh, basically said the same thing as me we we're older guys let's see if we can get in here as a safe custody officer some of these younger guys you know we knew them we knew who they are you know and who their parents okay yeah. but these guys did 34 year wrecks yeah, for two three murders in that gangland kind of postcode madness so we drew out some guys some really good guys as well to punish you and brought about mentoring skills i brought in a friend who um, i'd worked for on the outside when i set up a foundation prior to that and we brought in basically instilled certain things uh you know conflict resolution basic common sense stuff had them go down in the first night center identified the young people who were coming in with quite a gang nominals they wouldn't say it to the office because they're frightened to go to court that's aggravating fact it's going to be more time so they'd say what they, they were part of a gang that'd be kept privately we wouldn't go to security but we'd get them transferred to a different wing but it didn't have conflict and then we'd uh basically get two guys from the areas who were dominant in the prison to basically squash the beef when we done that they incentive was an extra gym session little bits and pieces peacock's gym came in with us oh, yeah. uh you know the guys martin and tony you know got quite a good lived experience and they had access to a lot of good people as well you know who would come in and speak and stuff like that and the course itself was a success but that was my inroad to how i could get courses into prisons you know, and it had good results. And today I deliver courses. We're just developing one at the moment for a new prison. We've uh, one contract for HMP Fossey Way with Serco, which opens in Leicester. So, you know, and that's the road. I've called to go back to Whitemore to help with their young adult wing. So that's a complete 360 turnaround, making a living out of, you know, the criminal justice system where I spent time. And being able to help people is a great thing because you can help people. Everyone's got a friend that goes to prison. Of course, everyone, everyone does. If you don't know someone who's not gone to prison, then yeah, it's, they're lying to you. Completely. So, you but know. finish off the story with the six kilos. Yeah, so basically, long story short, um, I got talked to something with someone. He had been a police magnet for a period of time. Obviously, he had a whole string of people he'd be getting arrested. Yeah. He came to me, he was broke, needed some money, asked me, you know, to do something. I could have said no, but of course, me being so, I'd never say no. So I said, not a problem, arrange something to happen. I wasn't going nowhere near it, but then, of course, on the, the day of the event, he was like, can you please come with me? Come with me. So I was like, you know, I was going to leave it hanging in the air at such a short note. I said, okay, not a problem. If you pick it up and I'll drive behind you. Now, not a good idea to be following behind a vehicle with drugs in it. But I said, this is going to be the deal. If um, you've got the stuff, what you can do is please turn up, which they could at any time. I didn't know he was being followed around by the police and what he was doing with them. But I said, I'm going to so take... Was he an informant? He was I don't know. The word informant's a big word to throw around. I think he was a conscious informant. I think he knew he was getting everyone arrested. You, 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 you wouldn't have known you weren't getting people arrested, okay? And he was pulled in at one stage, which was a statement was never revealed what was said. But the reality of it is he was just probably happy getting people arrested, taking their drugs, and not having to pay them back their money, you know, and carry on going on that path. And there are lots of people that do that shit. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, at the grand finale on the day, long story short, uh, Driving back, following him, bang, police car did arrive out of nowhere. So I had done what I was doing. I took the police car out the road. And of course, me taking the police car out the road, yeah, with three months, four months maximum, I would deal with that. This moron decides to pull up in the, um, yeah, pull up in the lane with six kilos of coke well, in the back seat. Yeah. And then, of course, <laughs> everyone's arrested. What the fuck's the point of you taking him out of the road then? No point whatsoever. I could have stayed at home yeah. in luxury my ass. But you do these things because you sign up for it, isn't it? You know what you're doing, okay? You're in the game, but you know to what level you're doing it. But obviously, if you're running with soldiers, you've got to trust them what they're doing. And if they're driving, they take off with a the thing because you're putting your liberty 100%. at risk. Anyway, 
that happened, but then what really twisted the term was basically when he went to court, he said he was under duress. Yeah, so that was a pretty much the fucking, oh, I, you know, that was nailing the coffin, weren't it? And the police loved the idea of me, you know, having someone so under duress. So they just threw the book straight so they, at you. Yeah, absolutely. But the mad thing was, as I said, you know, all right, got sentenced, got my time, fair enough, deal with that. But something absolutely mad happened a few months ago. I was invited to recently, the old, yeah, yeah, recently, about three months ago, it happened. I was invited to the old Bailey for this knife crime convention, and uh, the knife crime convention basically is really, really good, good, good event the Metropolitan Police put on, and they have a load of kids from the Pru People Referral Unit. They sit in what is the uh, the jury uh, yeah, um, yeah. gallery, and they have people speak. They had a barrister one there; she was fabulous. She was a QC. There was a lot of murder cases. She had it very hard. Grew up in the East End. Casey, now. you know, single mother. Huh? Casey now. Casey. Casey, yeah, yeah Casey. It's not Casey, yeah, no more, Casey, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I get confused about stuff easily, yeah, yeah. So she was speaking about, you know, how bad it is and what's going to start happening. They're given 30 year ex, kids are going to prison, and they're actually thinking, oh, I can do 30 years because I'm 20 now, I'll be 50 when I get out. That's a long stretch. Man. They're, bringing, they're going to make 50 year ex. That's what's coming. I'm telling you now, I promise you this. In the next two years, if it continues, they're going to be giving out 50 year ex on murder. I promise you that. And how long do you do all that? It's free first. 50 further. years. 50 years before your first tariff. If you get a wreck, a recommended sentence is the minimum you do before your first chance of parole. You don't even get your first parole. Raw. So just know that's what you're doing, okay? Full 50 years. Full 50 years, plain. But do you know what I say as well, yeah? I think that it, problems happen when they start doing that. Because it's a deterrent, yes. One part is a deterrent, I'm going to get 50 years. Fuck that. But when you've been given 50 years, if I got 50 years, yeah? God forbid I get it, but I got 50 years. I'm going to terrorise that prison. I'm going to. I'm not coming out. What the fuck? Are... And you know the worst thing about that? What happens? When you go to prison, everyone with a big sentence has the same idea. And what they realise is, when you got... It's not one person. Everyone's doing it. Everyone's doing it. And then what that means is, it sets off an atmosphere in a it's prison, a which is... It's, it's, a, it's an environment... Okay, which is hell, and that's what it is. But and you've that's got to watch over your shoulder 24 7. 24 7. And you're right, the biggest sentence is I haven't really achieved anything. What needs to be changed is from a street down. You know, kids have to be given intervention. You've got to get in early to let them see. But what needs to be told are stories. These guys who are doing, listen, up in dispersal, and I mean the biggest gang members, okay, who the biggest names that have been in conflict in Birmingham, Manchester. All these gangs where kids are still part of and still killing each other on a daily basis of all the guys who were sentenced 20, 15, 25 years ago for shootings are all sitting together having food boats, okay? Where you boil your food together, you cook together, you eat together. Yeah. And kids today are killing each other over them same beefs. Yeah, and right? they're sitting chilling together. So what needs to be done is you need to have those guys speak out allow them to speak out allow them to actually let them change change five six years ten years of the sentence and let them mentor some of these kids from distance learning okay mm -hmm. to let them know it's all a fucking lie you sold this dream some music as well fell for it music nowadays every everything is all about being in a gang if you're not in a gang you're not making money and i spoke to someone the other day and he, he said something to me he goes mikey he goes money on the streets isn't the same like it was he goes, money on the streets, back in the day, there was money. There was he goes, money. there was money. Yeah, there was money. He goes, now, the place to find money is online. Yeah. He goes, the same way people were making money on the streets, it's all online now. Look, you know what? I can't, that's, that's, a, that's a, yeah, it is. There's lots of money online, everyone, but not everyone can be an entrepreneur, not everyone can do a business. There's that. just as much money on someone going to get themselves a trade. If you've got a young yeah. person, 17 years old, sets out to become a plumber, I'll tell you this now. My friend, yeah, I shout, I've never shouted him out. He's my, my best mate, Nick, yeah? Yeah. He's a plumber. Started off as a plumber at 18 years old. He's now got six vans. Yeah. He's 25 now. Yeah. Got six vans working for him. Three cars out. He's got he's got about ten a ten yeah. car fleet. Yeah, at twenty four year old, he's a millionaire. Of course he is, all day long. And, and practically, what he's done is he sacrificed maybe six years maximum yeah. of doing the training, you know, internships, the low paid jobs, and he's built it because the reality of it is, this is the average stance of a guy on the road. You know what success is? Go on, tell a me. A car that's quite nice. Yeah, a nice watch, watch. a pretty girlfriend. That's what they think, yeah. That's the mentality, that's it. No houses, no businesses, no. that's the mentality. They want right? a sexy woman, nice watch, nice car, And, and get into five, five keys, get into five bricks, yeah? yeah? That's a success. They've hit the jackpot. Now, 
Let me show you the hit the jackpot comes with that, yeah? You get dabbed with his five keys, you probably get seven or ten. Okay, right? Yeah. Then you get in a conversation order, so the car's gone, the watch is gone. The girlfriend ain't gonna last more than two years, okay, right? If you're lucky, because usually it's the pill they sell, so they're all, you know, gonna get an appeal for this one. Yeah. Now, these kids just don't only get the drugs charged, they get a murder charge with that, because they ain't doing business like that. They're doing business, they're robbing each other, yeah. they're, you know, doing all kind of shit, and to even get to that stage, they've got bodies under them, right? And the sentence ain't a seven, do half. The sentence is a 25 wreck, do that. Yeah, and I see it. I see it in the visit room. I see the kids coming in. It breaks my heart. You know, they're coming in. The kids start off a little, and then you know, you see the kid get there, get from you know maybe one years old, get them to four years old. Then suddenly the visits ain't coming no more. Few and far between because she ain't got the money to be travelling up to, yeah, you know, so. up and down the country where they're going to send you to. They're going to go to where prisons they feel like doing it, and then you see everyone's eating. They've got these food boats. You know, everyone's eating well. And then say they ain't got no money because no one's sending them no money. Then they become hostile on each other because now they want to rob each other in prison. Do you know what I mean? And then you've got an environment now of what can I describe as of a hell on earth. Now, if you knew this before you pulled that trigger, before you'd done that move, you should have thought about that. My profession was we take calculated risks, okay, and it comes with the territory. I knew what I'd done. I signed up for that, yeah? I take the consequences of what I do, what I've done. People can't take the consequences because it, the, the price they're paying is too great. But just know, when you've done something, you know it's, it's clear mark, it's up there, sentencing guidelines, they're there, they're plain and simple. So before you do it, think about what the consequences is going to be. And back to the story with the old Bailey. So I went to this oh, yeah, event, sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, I was sitting there and someone said to me, Andrew, that judge keeps staring at you. And I'm like, what? Because you had a judge there who's off thing, he hasn't got the wig on, yeah, the gown, yeah, yeah. right? And you've got this barrister talking about this thing, you had this physician, this surgeon guy, brilliant, he was number one in the country, he was showed all these pictures of knife wounds, gun wounds, horrendous it was. And you had, you know, various people talking, you know. A mother who lost her son, which is terrible, you know, he's still at school, and she got to get the knock at the door from the police, right. and then when she went there, he was a doctor for a surgery, he died, horrible experience. And I absorbed it, I took it all in. And the person goes, that judge just keeps staring at you constantly. When it finished, after they thanked everyone for attending, and they said, we'd like to thank Judge Katz for staying on. And I was like, fuck, he gave me 15 years. So what I'd done was, at the end of it, I thought, how am I gonna deal with this one? This is really strange. And I waited until the kids left the um, witness um, a gallery, and I walked up, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, um, the jury gallery, I walked up through there, and at the old Bailey courtroom one, there were four large chairs it's a slim gangway and then obviously you've got the back where he enters, enters his chambers as i walked around and as he was walking through towards his chambers i walked out and i stood right in front of him and uh i gave him my card and he looked and i goes i looked at him like that and he took my card i goes you don't remember me do you and of course i'm in his space and I'm in a safe, which is safe for him. Yeah. And it's a space, basically, which it's a space that it's about reform. It's about, you know, changing people's lives. So his consideration immediately is, I've got to be someone either that the police has invited along or a charity or someone speaking or a barrister. I have to be someone in that space. And he goes, no, I don't, with a big smile on his face. you know. So, like, he, so you said to him, you don't remember me? Don't remember me. And he's like, no, he said, I can't. I said, you gave me 15 years. And his face absolutely dropped. He was like, fuck. And he goes, what's your name? I said, Pritchard. He goes, oh my God. He says, of course I remember you. And he goes, your name keeps coming up. Now I know why, because what happens is certain kinds of people, when you get sentenced, <laughs> when they're released, they have to make the judges aware, just in case you were that kind of person. Yeah, that it goes back and hurts does, does something to them, right? So you do, they re so all your family, well, you re revisited maybe once a year, right? Anyway. Um, he goes, I'm so sorry. He goes, I really said, sorry, I apologise for giving you a sentence like that. So I paused and I said to him, and I laughed and said, well, why did you? Because that's a great question. Why did you then? And he was like, look, sometimes the powers that be. So I was told to get that sentence, okay, from higher powers than him, okay? Wow. And he was then expecting another reaction from me, especially telling me that. And I said, no. I said, thank you for giving me that sentence because you changed my life. And he was like that. 
I goes, no, thank you. I said, I'm here today, not in handcuffs, in the fucking dock. I'm here today talking to young people why you shouldn't sign up to this life. Okay, anyway, I went back and I was in shock to put this chat. It was like closure for me because I had my power back. You yeah. know, this judge was so big and powerful, you know, on that bench with his wig and his thing. And then I sort of towered over this guy. He was a little skinny little guy in his suit and his bald head. And I looked quite <laughs> frightened. He looked frightened, you know. And it was like, wow, it's a moment of power. Yeah. And I went back and I went onto the LinkedIn. And I, you know, I told the story. I said, you know, today's really a moment of closure for me. And another judge came on there, made a comment. Who, um, who had uh, uh, I'd written an article for his magazine called Fighting Knife Crime not so long ago. And he, you know, said this is amazing stuff, Andrew. I can't believe, you know, this is a great accomplishment. As a judge, I would like to have maybe met someone that I'd sentenced in that environment. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And then another judge came on a woman judge. She said this is quite a remarkable thing. Then the other judge came back and said, "How would you like to speak at the judges' convention in Warwickshire?" That's criminal. Yeah, or, you know, a branded criminal, let's get it right yeah, yeah. here, right, for 35 years, the system has one rule, keep organised criminals away from judges. If that happens, you've invited a, a fox into the chicken coop. Yeah. Okay, it's all over, yeah? And I thought, they've invited me in, so the powers that be now have changed. Yeah, of course. You know, and I do what I do, and I'm proud of doing it. That I can tell was your closure that day. That when you, because then, and as well, you know, like, fuck me, 15 years for six key. It's a bit much. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know but what? what can you say? What do you know you what? Say? How I look at it like this, I'm lucky to be alive, you know, yeah. because when you become such an irritation on such levels, you know, it's very easy for you to end up in a scenario of mistaken identity. And he was in so and so company, and it was an armed raid, and by accident, you know, the gun went off. And it happens, you know. Course, Don't kid yourself, course, it's course, Britain, it does, it does happen a lot. Do you know listen, what I mean? I always say to everyone, I've read a lot of people come on and say, well, but the police can't do that. I want to say one thing, and you'll be the one that agrees with me. It, whatever they want to do, they will do it. So, whatever they want to do. If I, they want to wipe you out, if they want to... Whatever they want to do, if they've been given the green light, they'll do it. Let me tell you, let me tell you here on this podcast, the CR, I'm a guy that's given police hundreds of thousands of pounds cash money to destroy cases to steal evidence to do shit you can pay people to do yeah. anything the only thing is they got a badge they're licensed to kill yeah okay that's what i'll say well, on that note it's a pleasure having you on the show thank you i look forward to seeing you again and hopefully getting you on for part two because i know there's plenty more to your story yeah but i will say apfoundation.org.uk is our site basically with the foundation we do lots of positive stuff you know we're running courses through ingius and maximus so anyone under the restart scheme was unemployed or leaving prison and probation will if you want to work in construction we'll guarantee you you can move forward to get a csc card with us we'll guarantee you a job interview to work with one of the big companies like scantia bayer group you know we can we can get you employment and that's not you know you know lip service here yeah, that's yeah, actually proper. real across the borders of peer mentoring we run peer mentoring courses that basically you know get you a career in peer mentoring if you're coming out of prison and you've done the courses and you want to get further involved and give something back you're right there with us if you want to get involved in media stuff like what you're doing right now we do that entrepreneur courses and it's all free guys you heard it from his mouth himself and it's all and free I'm, and i'm sure he's a man of his word yeah all his links are in the bio now just scroll down click it get in touch and let's see what we can work together. Look forward to seeing you again. I'll see you on the next episode.